That evening, Dorian was racing round and round and round his new home. He'd never been so happy in his life. He raced round the orchard for the 123rd time when suddenly he saw the two little green balls in front of the lily pond. Oh, wow, he said. It's all right, dog. The stories were about a boy called Henry in his magic garden. And in the garden, there were a number of flowers, including a tulip called Fat Tulip. And I just thought this notion of Fat Tulip was wonderful and stayed with it over the course of a weekend and thought, Henry's boring. Henry's just like this vaguely upper middle class name from a time gone by. Why don't we call this person, this thing, whatever it is that is the hero of the story, Fat Tulip? And then Fat Tulip can be whatever anybody wants him to be. My memories of Fat Tulip's garden are of a huge garden, uh, cameras panning through the undergrowth, Tony Robinson being so animated and lively and jumping all over the screen, throwing things over himself and seeing for the first time an adult behaving a bit like a loony and really engaging with me as a, as a young child. Um, and just my, my imagination running wild, just trying to think of who Fat Tulip was and who, who Inspector Challoner was and who these animals were and where they were living. Tony Robinson also imagined lots of things were there. So there was a mixture of using paint and really getting his hands dirty as well as sort of imagining it and, and creating something like a trifle in, in your mind. So he uses just the bowl and the trifles all in, in that bowl. So it was, I, I guess it was the, the use of all those different things. And just his energy as well was fantastic. The, and the characters themselves and the stories are great. The mixture of like Fat Tulip, who's so sweet and lovely, um, and also the animals, which is always very appealing to a child. Lots of like frogs and dogs and things like that. I think it's quite telling that when I watched the DVD for the first time after not seeing it for a few years, I was surprised that it was just Tony Robinson running around because in my memory, uh, the stories were so vivid. I, I thought there must have been some little frogs in it or some, uh, some other people in it, but it was just Tony Robinson telling the stories. And I, I think that really captured my imagination. At that time, I was very interested in mask work uh, and how if you hold up a mask, all you can see is the, the, the still eyes and the still mouth. And you as a listener, as an audience, can invest it with whatever you want to invest it with. It is, in a way, it's like a mirror on your soul. And that, uh, to me, that was part of the idea behind Fat Tulip, that he was a, a blank canvas with an exotic name and you could just fill him in how you wanted, although I gave him a sort of slightly weighty voice because I thought he probably was a bit weighty and probably ate a bit too much food. But it was up to people to uh, decide what they wanted him to be. I had this notion that the character of Fat Tulip, and indeed the whole story, was just like a huge mirror, or just like the reflection in, uh, in a lake. See what I just did there? Um, that when you tell the story, you're showing the audience that reflection, and they can take back from it the story as reflected through them. Debbie, my co-conspirator in creating it, decided that she wanted it to have some kind of reflection of my childhood. She wanted, she wanted to place it somewhere around where I'd been as a child. This landscape, this is my childhood, Epping Forest. My parents were both EastEnders, like so many hundreds of thousands of East Enders, either just before or just after the war, they, they left the East End, came down the Lee Bridge Road, past where all the Olympic uh, stadia were put up for the London Olympics, um, until they landed here. And this was, this was the epitome of countryside. This was the epitome of dreamland for them. And they just used to send me off to play in the forest like when I was four or five. No one would do that nowadays because they would think their child would be mugged or sexually assaulted. But it wasn't, it didn't feel like that at all, actually. But yeah, these, it was my dreamscape. Don't let that dog out of your sight! It didn't directly affect the storytelling. I didn't write particular stories because of my memories, but I'm sure it helped create 
that interior world for me, knowing that I'd been there before, knowing that these trees were the probably the sons and daughters of trees that had been growing here when I was a little boy. Tony Robinson and the woman who wrote the show, who's called Deborah Gates, uh, were from around the area and um, they went to someone they knew there to have a look at their house to see if they thought it was suitable for the filming. And they had a look around and they said, oh, we, we need something a bit more cottagey, this isn't quite right. So th those people said, why don't you try up the lane in Little Munkins? That, that might be what you're looking for. So they went up the road and they met my grandparents and they had a look around and they said, this is perfect. And my grandparents said, OK, fine. Um, when do you want to come and film? And they said, oh, we'll, we'll probably want to start shooting in about three or four weeks. And my grandparents said, oh, well, that's good. It'll give us time to um, tidy up the place. And they said, oh, no, 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 we, we like the overgrown cobwebby look. And I think that's reflected in the show, actually, as it came out. The fact that we shot it in a house where I had played as a child was just one of those eerie coincidences. But it certainly had that same ramshackle feeling about it. And in fact, we didn't have a... Uh, uh, we didn't have a set designer, we didn't have that kind of money, but our director looked at it and said, I, don't re I really don't want to change anything. We'll put specific things in if specific props are required, but apart from that, just leave it as it is. This is Fat Tulip's house. One time, uh, my brother and I tried to get into the airing cupboard in the bathroom, because that, in the story, is where Thin Tim lives, and he warms up his jam donuts. So I think my brother and I must have gone in to sort of try and get in the cupboard like Thin Tim does and maybe try and find some jam donuts and we actually broke the shelf in the airing cupboard when we were trying to do that. The, the, the richness of the images and the place um, is quite inspiring. I, I think, you know, I, I and my family were really lucky to have that place in our, in our life because um, it helps trigger so many creative instincts and storytelling impulses and also the woods opposite the house as well. You know, again, uh, around here, they're just full of little um, areas, great big gnarly old trees and fun little lakes with islands in. The idea of my stories was always that they were kind of set in the landscape. You know, if I was, if I was telling a story here, someone would be behiding, behind that at least five times during the course of it. There would be someone who would pretend to be a monster, so they would get a pair of monster hands, they'd hide behind there, and they'd have the, just the, their hands on sticks, but the person in front would think it was a monster, and then at the end they would reveal themselves, and they were just an ordinary person with monstery hands. That, you know, I don't know, I'm just making that as I go along, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, any environment, I will try and dramatise it and try and make it a springboard for the imagination. I only think if you do that, then, well, that's what kids do most of the time, isn't it? And I think that, inevitably, they're going to, uh, to come along with you because you're encouraging them to do the kind of thing that they're likely to want to do anyway. My absolute belief, my inspirations had always been people like Roald Dahl and Joan Aitken and Diana Wynne-Jones and the Grimm brothers and uh, Hans Christian Andersen, all of whom I felt were writing not for children, but for, were writing from themselves into the space where they wanted to address children. And when you do that, then you're not actually... It's not a, it's not a children's thing, is it? I think all of the great writers, you, can, you, you get a sense of that, that adulthood constantly playing with the themes of childhood, and, and kids love that. Other shows tended to be uh, an adult sitting in a stuffy chair reading a story, maybe putting on a voice, maybe um, giving a bit of animation, but there was no one that I remember acting out stories. There was no one that was engaging you as a viewer, as a young child, and kind of coming down to your level and almost kneeling in front of the TV and, and telling you the stories and, and describing the characters in such vivid detail. There, ahead of them, was the big pond. I certainly wanted to encourage children to be imaginative, without any doubt whatsoever. I also wanted to try, as an act of faith, to say to them, actually, you can make better movies than Spielberg because you've got all those resources in your head. You just have to start, that's all you have to do. And if in any way I encouraged children to, to lift their imagination a little bit further towards the sky, then that's job done. Well, I say incredibly fast, to you or I it would have been so slow that it would have been incredibly boring. But for a tortoise it's fantastically fast. 
it would make you use your imagination. As a child, I was very, um, very imaginative, you know, writing stories, dreaming up of all kinds of adventures and the like. Lewis Collins reached Fat Tulip's house and he jumped. And do you think he jumped over the roof? No. Do you think he got as far as the bathroom window? Well, maybe I've never quite grown up and I still love watching kids' TV programmes and um, set storytelling and things like that. And there's certainly influence, because I'm, I'm, I'm an interior designer, so there's certainly influence from my grandparents' house, where Fat Tulip was filmed, for example, on my design. So I, maybe it works in lots of different ways for me. And they hopped out of the washing up, through the kitchen window, and landed on the path with Ernie spitting out soapy water. <laughs> I think it was something that really got me interested in stories and uh, creativity. I've always tried to write stories and uh, I used to, in fact, write a blog and one of the things I did just before my grandparents sold the house was go up on my own one night and wander around the garden and just remember it and I wrote a blog about that. I've always wanted to be a writer, researcher and performer ever since I can remember. And I think Fat Tulip coming on TV after school gave me a special space where I could sort of hone my imagination through coming up with my own imaginative stories through various things and ideas that I discovered in my travels, either around the block, on TV or on holiday with my parents. And so this style of surrealist and absurdist storytelling was probably my earliest exposure to developing more logical thinking skills to piece unstructured information together in original ways, which I now use in my profession to develop theories in social science research, which is more logical than most people realise. My mum also encouraged me to be a bit theatrical as a child with drama lessons and things like that. I'm an only child, and so I think all of that and watching shows like Fat Tulip gave me an outlet or a space for practising acting skills and developing confidence as a solo performer which I used throughout my life, really, as a public speaker and a musical performer. The influence that Fat Tulip's had on my adult life um, has been mainly um, with my nieces, or now my young daughter, who's nine months old. So anytime I read bedtime stories or I tell them stories around the house, I try and act them out. So recently I had a, a story about Trevor, the mouse that lived in my house uh, by the fire, uh, which was based on a true story, because he did used to come in uh, till I chased him out but I would invent uh, a voice for Trevor the mouse and my niece would ask me about him and I would, I would explain where he lived and how he got food and act out the voice of his mother and like getting in trouble for not going to school and all these kind of things. So it's had an impact on, on me for my imagination, for storytelling, for the importance of storytelling to young children um, and even to adults as well. As, as adults, sometimes we need to go back and have that kind of um, mystery and intrigue and excitement that we had as young children. Brown, squidgy, slimy, oozy mud. Every morning, he'd do his exercises. He'd get out of his hole. I think that Fat Tulip was successful because I wanted to encourage myself to continue to create all these, these layers. It's a great word, palimpsest, which means uh, an old canvas that has, from the old days when canvases were very expensive, so somebody paints on it and then somebody else wants to paint something else, so they scrub it down and paint something else on top. And then they scrub that down and something else and scrub it, scrub it down. And that patina that, that's left, that, which is, comprises of a thousand different pictures, a thousand different stories, is, is called a palimpsest. And that, that's always been my ambition for stories like Fat Tulip. They just, they just have all these echoes, which don't have to be conscious. They're just kind of there in the ether. Rather than write them and read them, which was the standard way of uh, telling stories on television, I would improvise them. I just felt that it would create more of an imme immediate atmosphere. I needed to be strategic, but at the same time, I needed to be as fresh as possible. So I would be constantly looking for new words. Or if things went wrong, that was best. You know, if suddenly the, uh, uh, the, the lid comes off a saucer, it's a snake or whatever, it's a hat, it's a chariot. Um, 
then we, then we go off on one. But then, because I've pegged it in so hard in my mind, it means I can get back to where I wanted to go to, rather than getting lost in the improvisation. I had always believed that if you hold up an orange and say to a kid, what's that? And they say an orange, you can go, no, it isn't. Look, it's the sun. No, it isn't. Look, it's an ostrich egg. No, it isn't. It's a, oh, something in there. I don't know what that is. In other words, one of the great things about imagination is that it, it, it can subvert the traditional vision of what a thing is. And I think that's probably one of the main driving forces behind any kind of art, that you're constantly challenging yourself, you're constantly uh, challenging uh, your viewer, you're constantly challenging the world. And by doing so, hopefully, you're allowing your children to do that too. What I didn't want to do was end up with a lot of kids who wanted to shoot up heroin because they just wanted to try any old experience because that's what I told them to do. I wanted to create a, a world that had uh, that had morality in it, in the sense that, that uh, people should be responsible to each other, people should have solidarity with each other, people should enjoy each other, people should create together, people should work towards happy and successful outcomes. Again, I didn't like sit down and think, you know, have that list in front of me, in front of the desk when I was writing, but that was just, that was part of my spirit, as it were, um, and that was, that was the kind of narrative that I wanted to create.